petit peu tranquille, non Oui, bien sûr. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Carl Molden. I'm a first year studying government. And also I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Junior Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Harvard Kennedy School, school students Levente Fasikas and Alejandra Perez Weinold. Hello everyone, welcome to the JFK Forum. We would like to welcome you to this event, Europe's position in a multi-power and polarized world. Uh, part of the European conference organized by the Harvard students. And um, we would like to thank our sponsors, the Balfour Center and the Center for European Studies. My name is Levente, I'm from Hungary. I am also study at the Kennedy School and I'm part of the coordination team of the European conference. Uh, first, I would like to uh, express our grat gratitude to Mr. Uh, Peter Siarto, the longest serving foreign minister of the European Union for joining us to this event. He was first elected to the Hungarian National Assembly in 2002. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandra. I'm from New York City, and I'm also one of the conference coordinators. I have the honor of introducing Arancha Gonzalez. Ms. Gonzalez is the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs at Science Po. She also served as Spain's Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union, and Cooperation from 2020 to 2021. In addition, we are very lucky to have Dr. Karen Donfried moderating this discussion. Dr. Donfried has served as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, as Secretary of State Blinken's top advisor on Europe and Eurasia. Please join us for welcoming our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone, and kudos to all of the organizers of the European Conference. It's been a fantastic day so far, and I have the privilege of moderating this conversation between Minister Gonzalez and Minister Siharto. The topic is about Europe's role in this complicated world that we live in. There are so many ways we could take this conversation. But based on the position I left not that long ago, I think we should start on the European continent because certainly Russia's war against Ukraine is roiling not only the European continent, but the implications are global. As we know, in the, we're almost at the two year mark of that war and we saw Ukrainians bravely and with great resilience stand up to this unprovoked invasion from Russia they've also gotten a lot of help from the United States and from Europeans, the European Union. So if we think about this moment in the war, for Ukraine, that external assistance is still so consequential. The European Union earlier this month, on February 1st, reached a decision on a four-year package of $54 billion to continue to assist Ukraine. And I thought that was a good place to start because on the one hand, we've seen incredible unity in the EU. Hungary, Spain have been a part of those decisions over time. But this last decision in December of last year, the Hungarian prime minister chose to block that package of assistance to Ukraine. On February 1, there was a unanimous decision in support. And Minister Siharto, I thought let's start with you and help us understand what changed between December and February for Hungary. First of all, thank you so much for uh, this really generous invitation. When I uh, received the email first, 
I thought whether it's a joke or a misunderstanding, but uh, but then uh, then it was proved that yes, uh, the email was sent to me and uh, was an invitation. So now I'm here, and thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. When it comes to uh, the situation in our uh, neighborhood, you know I'm coming from Hungary, the country which is a uh, neighboring country to uh, Ukraine. And uh, we have been, unfortunately, living in the neighborhood of this war for almost uh, two years, with all its consequences. We have uh, received more than uh, one million refugees from Ukraine. There are 1,500 schools in Hungary where refugee kids are being enrolled. We have been uh, carrying out the largest ever humanitarian operation of the history of our country. Our um, government and non-governmental organizations which are supported by the government have been carrying out assistance programs in 20 counties of Ukraine reaching uh, 500,000 Ukrainian families and hundreds and thousands of Ukrainian refugee kids had been hosted in uh, Hungary for, uh, for summer and winter camps. And we have been, we have been taking care of wounded soldiers and, uh, and wounded kids in uh, Hungary as well. <laughs> when it comes to the uh, recent decision of the European Council, which was based on uh, unanimity, we had uh, two very important uh, preconditions which we asked the European uh, Commission to meet. And we made it very clear that in case of these preconditions are being met, we can be part of the common decision. One very important precondition was to give a guarantee that uh, the money which should have been transferred to Hungary in the recent more than one year, during which the European Commission has frozen the European funds to Hungary, will not be part of the package. This was our first request. And the second request was to um, have a control mechanism. To have a control mechanism uh, based on which, on an annual basis, we can have a review about how this money has been spent and in case it's necessary the European Council will be in a position to give guidance to the European Commission in transferring this money to Ukraine. Both of these preconditions of ours have been met. We got the necessary guarantees so there was no reason not to be part of the common decision. That is what happened. So in December, had you set those same preconditions and the other EU members were not willing to go along with them? Well, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, common situation, very, happens very often, that we put some serious issue on the table and the others act as if there was no issue on the table. Pretty frustrating, I have to tell you, pretty frustrating. The problem is that um, for the last couple of years, this has been the case in Europe and this has been versioned by the fact that the uh, war has broken out in our neighborhood, that there's no real space for rational kind of dialogue in Europe about strategic issues. And this is one of the reasons why you see that uh, Europe has now been overtaken by China when it comes to the, uh, comes to the share of global GDP, for example. There's no space for rational type of dialogue. Why? Because in case we put forward such a request, in case of discussing spending money on behalf of the European people to Ukraine, the answer is not that, OK, let's discuss and let's see how we can resolve. The reaction is that we can pick of three stigmas, whether we are friends of Putin, propagandist of the Kremlin or spies of the Russians. If there, was a, if there was a space for rational kind of dialogue, and if there was mutual respect, and if those who speak about democracy would listen to those 
who might happen to have a slightly different opinion than the majority. Then these ideological debates, these stigmatizations uh, could be spared. I may come back to you on that because to, you're suggesting somehow that all the other EU member states think alike and don't disagree about things and Hungary's the outlier always and I want to dig into that but first Minister Gonzalez I want to come to you because you also have deep experience in the EU and I think at the beginning of Russia's war against Ukraine Vladimir Putin did not think did not think that the transatlantic relationship would stay strong in the face of that invasion. And yet we've actually seen a great deal of unity. And now you have the privilege of being outside of government. How does this look to you? Let me first uh, thank uh, you uh, for hosting us uh, today and hosting this debate about Europe and doing this in the US. Um, and this is what drove me to come here. And let me make a bit of a disclaimer because I've got a Spanish flag behind me. And of course, I'm <laughs> Spanish, but I'm employed by Sciences Po in France. So maybe, maybe, just so that I have a job when I go back, <laughs> it would have been good to have a European flag behind <laughs> me. And this is the role that I will play. I'll play the role of the European in this conversation. Let me start by saying that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a shock to Europe. And this is why Europe feels this war is so particular to Europe. Not that there are no, that there are no, that there are other wars in the world. And we should be showing the same empathy to every conflict, every war that is happening around us. But for us, this is a very painful war because it's basically a denial of who we are. The EU was born after atrocious wars of territories, of grabbing territories, of redrawing borders, invading countries. This is the history of the European continent for centuries. When we thought we had settled this account, when we thought we had found another method to relate to each other, we found that the neighbor next to us, you don't choose your neighbors, you get neighbors. The neighbor next to us was renouncing to who we thought we were and who we think we are. A respect for the rules of international law. So it was a bit of a difficult moment for us. And I want to start here because um, sometimes when I travel around the world, people tell me, you know, what's so particular about that war? We have to explain what is so particular about this war. This is why the antidote that we Europeans found was important to respond to this war was unity. Stay united is what would get us to let our neighbor know that this is not the behavior we would tolerate as a neighbor, neither for Ukraine, nor for the European Union or any of the neighbors of Russia. Now, of course, Karen, unity is costly to build and even more difficult to maintain. Why? You know, you're, this is a school of international affairs, this is a school of negotiations, you know that when you want to preserve unity, well, anyone can use this moment to ask for something else and to put a price. Now, we can, obviously, we try to do this in a European family because we are family, we try to do this as family, but sometimes it doesn't show right? Sometimes it shows a little bit different. different huh? It's like we are negotiating with our own values. And it's important because I don't think we can compromise on those values. But let's stay with, uh, let's say, for now, let's stay with the message that it's unity that has prevailed, costly unity, 
sometimes costly in time, sometimes costly in money, sometimes costly in many other uh, things, including credibility. But let's say that it's this unity that we have been able to maintain against all odds, and that it's this unity that will be very valuable vis-a-vis uh, -vis our neighbor and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Putin, who was obviously betting on uh, picking on the European family and uh, you know getting friends and foes uh, so that he would be able to rule on us. Sorry for the long and winding answer, but I thought it was important to also put this out there. No, and it really complemented in many ways what Minister Siharto said. And when you talked about how in the European Union we can't compromise on values, it comes back to these funds that are frozen by the EU, where Hungary is eager to get those funds. And 10 billion euros were released in December before the last European Council. But yes, there are still billions of euros that are frozen. And it's this disagreement over the rule of law where the EU has expressed real concerns about the independence of the judiciary in Hungary. So that's one aspect of this conversation. But Minister Siharto, you also, when you were saying this debate isn't rational, and you talked about how often Hungary is accused of having too close a relationship with Russia. And that's what explains Hungary's positions. And that issue of Hungary's relationship with Russia you're right that it is often pointed to. You know, I was Googling you, of course, before the session, and in so many articles, that is referenced. To, you know, Hungary's foreign minister traveled to Russia on Monday, this was in November of 2022, to take part in an international forum on nuclear energy, underscoring his, his country's persistently close ties with Moscow. Uh, the, a much more recent article, End of January, you went to Ukraine. Uh, that was your first visit to Ukraine. You were in Ushgorod to meet with your Ukrainian counterpart, Dmitry Kuleba. And it also refers to Hungary and your prime minister, widely perceived as the Kremlin's closest EU ally. If this is wrong, uh, I think it's very important that you share with this audience what leads to this misperception and how would you describe Hungary's relationship with Russia and maybe why those interests are different than the way some other EU members perceive their own interests? Why such kind of articles are written by, uh, written about us, about myself? If I have to summarize it in one word, I might say uh, hypocrisy. Because we Hungarians have always been honest. We have always been honest about our policies, about our strategy, about our goals, about our vision. And why we can be, um, why we can be honest? Because there's a um, uniquely stable political system in Hungary where we have been in office for 14 years, where we have won four consecutive elections with a two-third majority. Come on, this is the decision of the Hungarian people. This is what democracy is being called. And uh, we can afford to say what we do and to do what you say. Let me give you just one example. The, um, we have been receiving a lot of criticism from the United States for working together with the, the Russian Federation on the field of nuclear energy, right? Let me give you one data. You know who was the number one supplier of uranium of this country last year? The Russian Federation. United States have spent more than a billion dollars last year in the Russian Federation to buy uranium. In the meantime, we are being criticized for working together with the Russian Federation on nuclear energy. I'm responsible for the construction, personally, of our, I mean, as a minister, of, uh, of our new nuclear power plant in Hungary. And you know, the um, works 
of building the uh, cutoff walls of this new nuclear power plant, which is one of the most important work in order to be able to start to build new nuclear reactors, were constructed by a subcontractor to Rosatom, which happens to be a German-American joint venture. So please, when you say that who is close to Russia and who is not, just look at the data. Look at the data. Why we have an energy cooperation with Russia? I tell you why. Because as long as uh, you do not invent how to carry natural gas in a backpack, we are dependent on the energy infrastructure. We are dependent on pipelines. Five, six years ago, we have signed a contract with a big American energy company, name of which starts with E, and then you can imagine. Uh, we have signed a contract with them because for seven years they kept on telling us that they would exploit the gas in one of our neighboring country called Romania. We signed a contract based on which this gas should have been started to be delivered to Hungary last year. What happened? This American company has walked away from the project. The gas is not being exploited in Romania yet. So we are still dependent on the Russian energy sources. And when I pose the question, all right, friends, we're ready to get rid of the Russian gas. We're ready to get rid of the Russian oil. Which is the supplier, which company of yours, which delivers the same volume in the same timing with the same price? And there's no answer. And then my question is how a country should survive without gas or without oil? Or how the United States would survive without Russian uranium? Yeah, they can't, otherwise you wouldn't buy for a billion dollars in a year. So uh, when it comes to rationality, my position is that if we do not respect the reality of each other, then our discussions will only be ideological, and then we can quote articles, you know, uh, written by journalists who usually hate us. And, and this is not the way uh, to go forward. Rational dialogue is needed. This, this is our position. And I understand that, you know, we, you know, I'm representing a right-wing party. I'm representing a right-wing government. Very patriotic, very right-wing, very conservative government. Now, this goes totally against the mainstream, in, both in Europe and in the world. And we understand that it will never be, it will never be digested that a right-wing government can make its country successful even if, it, it's, even if it goes against the mainstream. And even it goes against friendly advices of allies. But let's leave it to the Hungarian people. The Hungarian people decide and they make a decision about the future of their country. And I think we should respect this. And instead of stigmatizing, instead of stigmatizing each other, pro-Putin, pro-Russia, closest to Putin, closest to Russia, let's, let's discuss based on, on, on reality. So and let's, let's respect the data and give some explanation if you want. So Minister Harter, you put your finger on a very important issue, which is energy dependence. And I do believe that was another critical issue that Putin had in mind when he undertook this full-scale invasion of Ukraine, believing that so much of Europe had this dependence on Russia for oil and gas, that that would influence the reaction. And we've seen quite a remarkable energy transition over the past two years. You can look at a country like Lithuania that started that transition much earlier and has zero dependence on Russia now from 100% dependence. You can look at a country like Germany that had 30% dependence. But this has been quite striking. And, and Minister Gonzalez, do you want to speak a little bit about the changes we've seen on the energy stage for Europe? No, I mean, let's, let's face it. When you have a neighbor that does not respect the rules of the game and you have a very close relationship with this neighbor on something that is pretty in intimate to an economy, which is energy, well, you have to relook at the fundamentals. 
And this is what happened in Europe. We looked at the fundamentals. And whether it was a right-wing government or a left-wing government, where it was a liberal government, where it was a government that had a huge dependency or a country that had a smaller dependency, the consensus view, actually the unanimity, because on things like this one, it was unanimity, was that we could not afford to be dependent on Russia for our energy. Now, again, this is not a small issue. Uh, to uh, decide on. This is not something that uh, we switch on from one day to the next. This does not come for free. But we also have to be a bit more fundamental. What's the price that we put to our freedom? And this is also uh, a bit the discussion we've been having in Europe. Now, not only have we uh, disconnected a big part of our energy um, market from Russia, not only uh, have we imposed heavy sanctions on Russian companies, not only have we closed uh, severe ties uh, with uh, business with Russia, we have also adopted a package of measures to make sure that the European citizens would be cautioned by the impact of this enormous transition that Europe has had to make. I want to underline the enormous part uh, in this conversation because I think it's also important in, in, in a country like the US that we realize the enormity of the decisions that Europe has taken unanimously after a lot of back and forth and that we are implementing. It's not a small thing. Now, it so happens Karen, that we also are in the middle of a green transition. So maybe we could also make virtue out of a necessity. Again, it doesn't come for free. We've got to be able to pay for this. I think the consensus view of Europe against all odds, because at the beginning there was always this new, you know, this, need, this noise that the European citizen will not accept this, that the European citizen will not support this. The reality is that we are in the middle of this big transition of decoupling in, in, in parts of our economy fully, in other parts gradually uh, from Russia, with costs for our economy, cushioning as much as we can the impact uh, for the citizens, helping businesses navigate this transition with this idea that at the end of the day, maybe this was what we needed uh, in order to make virtue out of the necessity to also decarbonize the European economy. It's tough medicine, but we are doing it. And we are doing this in a democratic way, like we do things in Europe, carrying citizens with us. So, Mr. Siharto, I wrote down in your last intervention, you said, we do what we say and we say what we do. That's very compelling. And I was thinking about it, and we've seen remarkable unity in NATO. One of the issues that has been a little challenging has been the ratification of Finnish and Swedish membership in the alliance. Finland's now in, Turkey has now ratified Sweden, and I remember you <laughs> saying last summer and in December, we will not be the last one to ratify. This is a promise that we will keep for sure. And now we're in a situation where you are the last to ratify. So what happened? But will you ratify, you think when the Hungarian parliament comes back into session, just? I myself, based on my promise, have uh, signed and sent a proposal to the Hungarian parliament to ratify the accession of Sweden to NATO, as I promised. The government has made this decision on time, not as the last one, and we have sent the proposal to the parliament to ratify the Swedish accession to NATO. We are usually uh, we are usually criticized and heavily attacked in the international political arena 
not to name by whom, some might be present, that we don't respect institutions, we put pressure on parliament, which should not be the case, and so on and so forth. The government has done what was promised. We have tabled our proposal to the parliament. The parliament decided not to put this on the agenda. And I tell you why. Again, very honest and very clear reason. The, uh, we have a two-third majority in the parliament. Many members of our parliamentary group have been elected five, six, seven times already to the Hungarian parliament. These people are working for their constituencies. They go out for the votes during election campaigns. They meet the people. They get their votes and then gain the seats. And what they had to listen to in the last five, six, seven years from Sweden? We are a dictatorship. It's not a democracy. The Hung Hungarian parliament is not democratically elected. It's not legitimate, and so on and so forth. They took it as an insult. With a good reason. With a good reason. And they simply don't understand how it is possible that those politicians who question the democratic nature of them being in that parliament now want them to vote something in favor of them. And I met on a numerous occasions with my Swedish counterpart, my colleague foreign minister. And I told them, look, Tobias, do something to rebuild the trust. Otherwise, we can't guarantee anything. What we could guarantee, we have done. We have put the issue on the table of the parliament with the very clear signal that the government supports the ratification. Nothing happened. We have invited the Swedish prime minister to come. The Swedish prime minister and the Swedish foreign minister have both visited uh, Turkey before the ratification took place. We just asked them to do so with Hungary as well. And then there's a good chance that on the 26th and 27th of February, when the parliament comes back into session, um, it can be on the agenda and the ratification uh, uh, could take place. But this invitation should be accepted by the uh, Swedish uh, prime minister. One more thing, if, I, if you allow me to, um, uh, to say to, um, to what you have raised, that uh, many countries have... Uh, basically left behind the uh, dependence on Russian energy, like the Lithuanians. Well, you know, there's one very important uh, difference. Lithuania is a country which has a seaside and can build an LNG, and we are a landlocked country, which is totally dependent on its neighbors. And we would like to buy gas from Azerbaijan and Qatar, but once again, we need a pipeline to deliver it to Hungary. So together with our friends from Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, we turn to the European Commission asking the European Commission to help us to increase the capacity of the pipeline network at the southeastern part of Europe to be able to increase the share of non-Russian gas in our energy mix. What was the answer? Sorry, we cannot finance such kind of investments because gas is not going to be part of your energy mix in 15 years. Okay, smart. But no one knows what's going to happen in 15 years. And even if gas is not going to be part of the energy mix in 15 years, what's going to happen in the upcoming 14? Or another issue. We have two pipelines through which we can buy oil. One from Russia through Ukraine, where we are now supplied, and another one from Croatia. We have asked the European Union to help us to increase the capacity of that pipeline from Croatia, because currently it's not enough to supply Hungary and Slovakia. They said, oh yeah, sometimes in the future. And what happened? Instead of increasing the capacity to be able to get rid of the Russian oil, my friends, the Croats have increased the transit fee five times. So when we speak about European solidarity, European unity, helping each other, being a family, getting rid of Russian energy, once again, we have to look at the reality and the, um, and, and the physical reality which is necessary from the perspective of energy. I can make really great statements on ideology. Yes, we have to get rid of it. We need that gas, that, that oil, whatever. But if you don't have the physical infrastructure, it's just a fairy tale. It's just a fairy tale, and, and you, can, you can just uh, mislead uh, the people. So, um, yes, I hope Swedish colleagues will uh, take advantage of the time until the 26th and 27th of February. They come to Hungary, and then I hope that the, the vote of the ratification will take place. 
Well, I do believe that NATO will be a stronger alliance for Swedish membership, and so I think for solidarity in the alliance, I too hope that that ratification will, will move forward. We're about to open to all of you, but I do just want to put one other issue on the table before I do that. And it has to do with Europe's relationship with China. I think it's another place where you've really seen a sea change in European attitudes in recent years. And Mr. Gonzalez, I, I would like to ask you to just talk a little bit about where that conversation is in the EU. We hear the European Commission President von der Leyen talk about de-risking, and there's uh, this phrase of China as a systemic rival. Um, and we appreciate at the same time that all of us have important economic relationships with China. And Mr. Siharto, of course, BYD is opening a new uh, manufacturing plant in Hungary for electric vehicles. And this question of how one balances the risks of a relationship with the investment. So maybe we'll start with you and, and then go to Minister Siharto. No, I mean, what's clear is that in a, more, in a world which is much more uh, driven by rivalry, uh, where power is much more a structuring feature uh, of uh, international affairs, uh, one has to look very clearly and one has to uh, evaluate the risks and uh, manage the risks a little bit better. It used to be the risks of doing business, now it's the risks of climate change and more recently geopolitical risks. And this for uh, the EU uh, as regards China means uh, uh, looking at this with a lens of managing those risks, understanding that uh, for the EU China needs to be a partner a partner, for example, to cut uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, the EU has cut significantly CO2 emissions. Today is 8% of the world emissions. China is still at 30% of emissions. It is important to have a spaces where you can dialogue, have a functional relationship with a country on which the future of our ability to live in this planet also depends. So, lens of this risk number one is partner, lens number two is competitor, a competition that is becoming uh, much more difficult, especially also in the green technology, in green investments, where a big part uh, of China is now redirecting its own investments, creating overcapacities that will enter into direct competition uh, with the European Union in Europe and in third countries. So this is an area where uh, Europe has clearly said uh, to China that it wants uh, to have a bit of a conversation to ensure that the rules of the game, the rules of this competition are fairer. And number three, it's also a rival. And it's a rival also in a spaces uh, where um, technology, the fusion between civil and military aspects of technology have an impact on Europe's security. So Europe wants to look at uh, its relationship with China through this risk greed. Um, again, partner, understanding that when a country represents uh, what China represents, emissions, financial stability, international trade, uh, economy and so on, you need to have a spaces to de debate, to dialogue, to negotiate, to construct together competition and rivalry. And this is where uh, the EU is looking at de-risking more its relationship with China, just like China is looking at de-risking more its own relationship with the EU. So in a way uh, is no more than uh, in a way being symmetric to what uh, the EU is, is seeing China do. So Mr. Siharto, do you agree with that that the trilogy of partner competitor rival and this focus on de-risking? If so, how do you think about an investment like BYD's where you will be the first European electric vehicle production facility for them? 
Well, first of all, you should know that the uh, annual trade between the European Union member states and the People's Republic of China has reached 865 billion euros last year. It's huge. We Hungarians do have a 1.2% share. 1.2% share of this. I wish we would have more, but uh, not yet. But what I can tell you is that we became the number one Central European target for Chinese companies to invest, which we are very happy with because we have won these races for these investments against other European countries. So for the BYD plant, for example, you know, BYD is now uh, outscoring Tesla in many data. For the first European plant of BYD, we were in a very tough competition with other European countries. It brings technology, state-of-the-art one, a lot of jobs, and helps us to uh, keep our economy growing. But why we became the number one investment target of the Chinese companies in Central Europe, the answer is the German industry. And i tell you why. We are one of the three countries in the world, besides Germany and China, where the top three German premium car makers are having separate factories. And all three of them have located a very important strategic part of their electromobility strategy in the framework of this energy transition into Hungary. So they are building electric cars a lot in Hungary. And you know who supplies them with electric battery? The Germans? The Chinese. So actually, why three of the world's top ten Chinese electric battery manufacturers have been investing in Hungary is the fact that they supply the Germans in Hungary. And imagine one of the German premium car makers have attracted its Chinese battery supplier not only to the same country, Hungary, not only to the same city, but next door. So in order to go from the Chinese factory to the German, they do not have to use public roads. Okay? So uh, when I listen to my German colleagues speaking about decoupling and de-risking, I always raise the question, all right, I understand what you say, Madam Minister, politically speaking, but then please give me the answer why the CEOs of the global CEOs of German companies keep on calling me and asking me to give incentive to their Chinese investors to come to Hungary. So um, when it comes to decoupling and de-risking again, I think the reality should be respected. The future of the European industry, European economy, is now a lot depended on the new age of automotive industry. And the backbone of this new automotive industry are the German companies. And if we cut their possibilities, you know, to work together with their almost exclusive Chinese suppliers, then we, we give another knockout for the European economy, which should not be the case. And my last sentence, um, the introduction was kind enough to mention that I've been in this office now in the 10th year. So I, I, I really negotiated a lot with Chinese. I managed a lot of agreements with them to bring investments to Hungary. But there was no single occasion. This is my experience, not the experience of others. I can only speak about my experience. There was no single occasion that they would have asked for anything political as an exchange. So in our case, they're never confused. Politics with economy, which is, I think, fair. And it should be the case in the future as well, and I will stick to it. So where others see risk, you see opportunity. And now all of you have the opportunity to ask a question. And there are microphones, and I, I'm sure there is already there are lines probably at the microphones, but I am just gonna, there, there's a microphone up there, a microphone up there, and I am just gonna rotate back and forth. So we will turn to our first question here. And please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is uh, Petro Kocerhan, Harvard Business School. And my question is to Mr. Minister. We really appreciate you coming here and being open for the conversation with student. Um, through your, um, through your responses, we see that you have many concerns towards the European Union. You, on multiple occasions, reach out to them. Please help us here. Please help us there. And you say that there is no response. At the same time, European Union comes to Hungary and says, please help us with this defense package for Ukraine and support package. And then you come up with new processes, requirements every time. Basically, there are some roadblocks. 
Don't you think that to have this unity, it needs to be on both sides? Some, uh, some flexibility, but also coming to these budgets, it seems that Hungary, in fact, is the net receiver of the EU fund. So it's also a bit puzzling for us here to see why Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, all of those who contribute to the EU budget don't have any problems with this money being distributed to Ukraine. But Hungary, on the other hand, seems to be the one that keeps a very close eye on this, on this fund. Thank you. Well, I wish we would be net receivers. The problem is we are not. The problem is we are not because the funds are frozen to Hungary. We're not receiving the money. We should be paid to Hungary. Being a net receiver does not mean that you are under humanitarian support. Because by joining the European Union, you make an agreement as a newcomer. You open up your market where obviously uh, companies of those countries which are capitally much stronger than you yourself will take a lot of advantage. And as an exchange, you get European funds. So I want to underline that European funds are neither humanitarian donations nor outcome of generosity uh, of the Western countries. This is based on an agreement. You open your market, you get the funds. Now, we opened our market, but we don't get the funds. Uh, I hope it will change. I hope it will change. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, our concern regarding the future relationship between Ukraine and the European Union is that we don't see the European Union being prepared for a, um, for a uh, di uh, dimensionally new cooperation with Ukraine. And this is not your fault. It's not Ukraine's fault. This is the reason, this is the outcome of the lack of a strategic discussion within the European Union, how we see the future relationship. And I hope that this debate will take place because it needs to take place at some point of time. And yes, we did have preconditions when it comes to 50 billion euros to be paid. European Union owes us a couple tens of billions of euros and they have very important preconditions, you see, because we don't get the money. So we had some important preconditions, they were met and then we agreed. So. I hope that uh, this money will be used by Ukraine in a, in a proper manner. But I, what I do hope even more is that your country and your people will be able to live in peace as soon as possible. Let me, uh, let me add, uh, if I may, um, compliment uh, Peter. Um, the EU is three things. The EU is markets. We tear down barriers in this market to give us size and depth, to give us competitiveness, to give us investments, to generate growth. Number two, the EU is community. It's written in the treaty. It's called solidarity. It's not charity, it's solidarity. And it's solidarity because it's Article 2 of the treaty. You want to ensure a convergence in the economies of all the members of the European Union. But let's not forget that the EU is also, and this is number three, never to be forgotten, family. And this family has a certain values. And it's Article 1, it's not two, it's one of the treaty. And these values are an integral part of the EU. It's not a la carte, it's respect for the rule of law, is democracy, is equality, and so on and so forth. Read it. It makes for a very interesting read. Family is also an integral part of the EU, and it cannot be forgotten. It's not one market bigger than two, community, or than family. It's the three together. And when the three are not there, they are also like in any family, rules of the game. So I, I'm, not, I'm surprised that I'm not seeing more people waiting at the microphone. Is there another microphone? Yeah, Here, okay, <laughs> where is there another microphone? Another person, another okay, I was seeing those two microphones, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gonzalo. I, I'm a student here, uh, also part of the organizing committee of the conference, so thank you so much 
for coming. I have a question for for Minister Sigarto. Um, you based your argumentation at the beginning on the support that Hungarian citizens made, majoritarian support, it's true. And I want to ask you if we here vote to not let the Hungarian students enter in this event and we get a majoritarian vote, uh, would that be a valid argument uh, with that? And, and more specifically, you do, think, do you think that minority rights, which is some of the things that Hungary is criticized in, in, in some places in the European Union, do you think that minority rights can be sustained and defended only based on majority voting? Thank you. Well, if there is a uh, country which uh, considers uh, minority rights important, then it is Hungary. Because if you know our history, you know that uh, huge territories from Hungary have been de-attached uh, from us following the uh, international decision, uh, as consequence of the international decisions following the First and the Second World War. So with that said, there are millions of Hungarians, ethnic Hungarians, who are living on the uh, territories of the neighboring countries. And we will always stand up for their rights. That caused a conflict between Ukraine and us way, way, way before the war, nine years ago, when the Ukrainian parliament started to um, adopt laws which diminished radically the rights of the minorities, including the Hungarians, when it comes to the access to mother tongue, in education, in public administration, culture, all spheres of life. And we have asked on multiple occasions the Ukrainians not to do it. Not to do it and to give back those rights to the Hungarians which they used to have before 2015. And when the war has started, then we made a decision that we put this issue in, in brackets, in the drawer. Not to forget about it, but put it there because Ukraine uh, uh, was attacked. Ukraine has to fight for its freedom, for its territory, for its sovereignty. So we found it inappropriate to continue to raise this issue. But then during the war, the Ukrainian parliament again put this issue on the agenda and adopted a new law, outcome of which 99 Hungarian schools had to seize its operation as minority school and had to continue as Ukrainian school partly teaching Hungarian language and then we said okay Put this on the table because we understand the Ukrainians do put it on the table during the war. We have to stand up So last week uh, as we had another meeting with um, Foreign Minister Kuleba and the uh, head of the presidential administration in Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Yermak uh, We have negotiated like half a day about this issue and we do hope that, um, that modifications of this law or these laws will take place and the Hungarians will be given back the rights what they used to have. And you know, it's interesting that we have seven neighbors out of which um, on the territories of all there are Hungarian communities. And the most rights and the fairest treatment uh, to the Hungarians comes from a non-EU member state, from Serbia. Serbia gives the most rights and performs the fairest statement, uh, treatment to Hungarians. So we do hope that the EU member states will catch up <laughs> with that. And we do hope that, uh, that uh, we can overcome this, this issue with, with Ukraine. It would be really great because it's a shadow on our relationship which, which we definitely don't need. Do you anticipate that your visit to Ukraine is the prelude to a meeting between President Zelensky and Prime Minister Orban? Well, uh, we made it very clear on many occasions that uh, in case we can open a new chapter in our relationship, uh, precondition of which is that the rights of the Hungarians must be given back, then we can uh, start the preparation. Please. Hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Max. I'm a student at the business school. I have a question for uh, Minister Ziarto. Um, you mentioned a lot your pragmatic approach to the relationship uh, with, with Russia. Now, does that pragmatism also then allow you to, in clear language and unequivocally, condemn the invasion of Russia into Ukraine? And if so, uh, were you, would you be willing to use your superior relationship with Russia to convey that message to the Kremlin? I have done it already. You know, because it's very easy to say such kind of things here, for example. It's very easy to say such kind of things in Washington, in Brussels, in all European capitals. My friend, try to do it in Moscow. 
There's only one person here in this room who has done it in Moscow before a much bigger audience than this. You know who that was? <laughs> Myself. I was sitting there at the meeting of the Energy Week, which was referred to uh, by Karen at the beginning. Unfortunately, liberal journalists uh, have forgotten about this uh, statement of mine to be written in that article. I was sitting there on the Russian Energy Week, Deputy Prime Minister of Russia on one side, CEOs of the biggest uh, energy companies on the other side, and thousands of people, 1,000. And I said it very clearly. This war is bad to us. This war is condemned by us. It would be really great if this war would be finished. Go to Moscow, do it. And then, then uh, I think it would be really, really uh, much, uh, it would make much more sense than just shouting from here, you know. Ah, but I understand it needs some braveness because here it's easy. We're going to take one last brief question from you. Minister Siarto, uh, I'm Victoria. I studied political science at MIT. Um, Hungary's relationship with Russia has come up a lot in this conversation. I just wanted to ask you about how Hungary sees Russia as a threat to NATO. NATO has now deployed a battle group to Hungarian soil. Is that important to Hungarian security? And how do you see NATO's enhanced deterrence efforts across the entire Eastern Front? Well, we are a committed member of NATO, and I'm proud to say that we are among those very few countries, very few countries in NATO, which has fulfilled the 2% requirement. Very few countries. We have performed it. Because this is our duty. And on the other hand, when uh, in case President Trump comes back and on the first uh, NATO summit he will read out the percentage as he did on his uh, first meeting back in 2017, as far as I remember, we don't want to be on the losing side. So we have, uh, we have performed the 2%. On the other hand, we have been contributing to NATO missions all around the world. Oh, sorry, um, we have, we've been contributing to NATO missions all around um, uh, the NATO countries where we are necessary to be there. The Western Balkans, for example, in the framework of K4, where unfortunately, you know, some of our um, soldiers have been very badly wounded uh, during the last uh, uh, sad um, um, developments. And uh, whether we see Russia as a threat to NATO or not, what I can tell you is that rationally speaking, I don't think Russia would risk an attack against a NATO member state. Why? Because of Article 5. Not in the EU treaty, but in the NATO uh, treaty. Which says that if any of the member states are being attacked, it should be considered as if all member states were attacked. And it's obvious that we are much stronger than Russia. NATO is much stronger than Russia, uh, militarily speaking. So if um, pragmatism or uh, logic still exists, then I should say that I don't see this threat because that would be very illogical. Let me, uh, let me um, end with a thought. This issue of security and defense and NATO is a big issue in Europe at the moment. And it's a big issue at the moment because NATO is a transatlantic alliance. Um, there's going to be an election in Europe in June and we are going to have to choose, we Europeans, we have to choose between deciding our own future and having somebody else decide it for us, especially having the election that is going to take place later in the year in this country decided for us. And NATO is a very important point in this conversation. And there are a number of uh, leaders around the world, but also in Europe, that are betting on certain results in the US election, not that they get to vote, but they are waiting. They are getting ready. Now, if we want Europe to be free in its own shaping of the future, we better make sure that we invest a little bit more in security and defense to buffer against decisions that will not be 
in the European hand to buffer against um, a possible future president of this country that will care less than the current one about NATO. So I leave you with this thought, uh, which uh, obviously um, is for some in this room to decide, especially those that get to vote here. We don't, but we'll be watching this. More importantly, we, I hope, will be getting ready later in the year. Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Siharto, we are living in a world where there are a proliferation of crises. And we only touched on some of them this afternoon, but this is a forum where we look to have candid discussions. And I want to thank you both for engaging candidly on these issues. And it's especially important to talk when we don't agree on everything, especially in the transatlantic relationship. So thank you both. Thank you for the questions. And please join me in showing our appreciation. Thank you.